thanks very much um, for coming to our session today uh, in lovely Budapest. And first of all, I'd like to thank EFDN for hosting the um, Tackling Color Blindness in Sport panel session. Um, so my name's Catherine Albany Ward, and I am the founder and I run the Colorblind Awareness Organization. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, color blindness and the prevalence of color blindness in elite sports people. Um, now this has come about as a result of our Tackling Color Blindness in Sport project, which is a three year project and it's just about coming to its end. So tonight is the culmination of three years hard work. And the project was set up with two main aims. One was to prove how many people are colorblind in sports in general. And the other was to create resources for you guys to be able to distribute amongst your um, contacts. So um, the, the partners of the project are on the screen behind me. I'm not going to run through who, all, who they all are. Um, but they've all been brilliant. <laughs> and um, what I wanted to talk to you about, first of all, was to give you some context, because I know quite a lot of you won't know anything about um, color blindness. Sorry. So that's because one in 12 men are colorblind, or boys, and one in 200 females are colorblind. So it's quite a lot of people when you think that a football squad is 11. So it's quite likely that every football squad, there's going to be at least one colorblind player. And our research has found that that is in fact the case. And if our research is extrapolated for um, the World Cup, we, would, we know that there are going to be about 50 5-0 colorblind players at the World Cup. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is to ask everyone on the panel to introduce themselves to you. So, can we start first with you, James? Yeah, um, good evening. So, my name's James Chiffy. I'm Head of Wellbeing and Development at Swansea City Football Club and also the founder of Beyond the White Line, um, which is a human-first, not-for-profit, looking to drive systemic change in sport. Hello, good evening. My name is Francisco Araújo, and I'm head of CSR of Portuguese Football Federation. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Adam Bibby. I'm from Oxford Brookes University, and I'm a senior lecturer. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Douglas. I'm Game Research and Development Manager at World Rugby, and I'm a former FIFA assistant referee. Hello everyone, um, my name is Nicholas Bignall, uh, I was a former football player and I did have colour blindness, well I still do, so I can just talk upon some of the issues that I had when I was playing. Thanks everybody. Um, so I think we should probably start by talking about the prevalence of colour blindness, which hopefully is actually a shock to all of you, that you wouldn't have known how many people are affected in sport. Um, so first question to Nick. Um, hello. Hello. Thank you for being in our video. No um, so you knew that you were colorblind, but all through your playing career, did you ever come across any other people that you knew were colorblind? No. But then there was quite clearly people that were colorblind. So it just speaks to the fact that people don't talk about it unless someone like yourself is really pushing the issue because. It took about 13 years for me to speak up, and that was only when I was in the first team, so I had a bit of power to start making changes to sessions and saying that I, I, well, I can't see these colors, can you please change it? But that was at 20, and I started playing football at seven, so it took a long time to even speak up. Uh, thanks. Could I just say to people at the back, please, it's quite noisy up here. <laughs> Could, um, would you mind? either going further to the back so we can't pick the noise up. You, but... <laughs> Not you, but can, can you pass the message on? Please? Um, so, so we know that there are a lot of players out there and we know that they don't speak up. Yep. Um, Adam's done a lot of research on this for the project. Um, what were you finding, Adam, in terms of the research? Yeah, so we've been doing some screening with uh, professional football clubs uh, across a range of different... Uh, uh, countries, so we have international senior squads, we have professional football clubs within the UK, um, and also in Iceland as well. 
In terms of prevalence, we've actually found out of the 118 that we've screened so far, that seven of those individuals at the highest level within football have some form of color vision deficiency. Um, so if we're looking at percentages, that's around 6%. Um, and if we're thinking about what is the, the actual normal percentage, that's a lot higher, so that's around 8%. So what that, that is suggesting that in every kind of football squad of around 25 people, there's about 1.5 individuals within those squads which, who are colourblind. Um, at the same time, if we're not seeing the same prevalence within elite sport, it's suggesting that actually people aren't making it to the top. So we need to provide support for those individuals to allow them to actually excel. And uh, Francisca and James, both your organisations are now screening or have screened for colour blindness. Um, so obviously you find it as an important topic that you need your players to be supported. Um, James, would you like to tell us your thoughts on what you found out? Yeah, I think, you know, it became clear the numbers statistically were, uh, you know, suggested that there may be one to two players within each squad. Um, with our club, it turned out to be accurate, and there, there were players that not only were colorblind and struggling, um, to be honest, or had cited that they've struggled at times during their career, but we've become now aware of players that are no longer, you know, with our organization or, or with others who never raised it. You know, they, they didn't bring it to anyone's attention. They feared the consequences of doing that, and it had a bigger impact. But I think for us, the... The, the screening should be standard, and, and, it, and it is now for us, um, but it's allowed us to adapt the environment, which you know I'll, I'll be careful not to go on to, but adapt the environment to improve the experience for, and, and opportunity um, for, for everyone involved. Um, yeah. Thanks, and Francisca, obviously, um, you're in the process of screening your players at the moment, and how, how did that get, um, when you raised the topic, how was that received um, at the Portuguese FA? Was it a shock that, that about the prevalence? No, we started this uh, talking with the coaches and they were aware of this topic. They, um, they know some players that are colorblind. Then we talk with the medical staff because they are uh, responsible for everything that uh, um, happens to the players when they are on the national teams. And they, they want to work with us on this and to, to um, implement a screening in every national team so we but we expect to have high numbers because the study said so so and speaking of high numbers I mark in rugby the squads are even larger so we're expecting two to three players in every male rugby squad do you think um, so rugby is catching up on the journey of the um, awareness that we've created initially in football and world rugby have really um, thrown themselves into supporting colorblind people, um, and mainly um, because of player welfare. So do you think that the statistics that we're finding in elite football um, will have an impact in getting um, rugby players and uh, rugby unions keener to identify who the rugby players are who might be affected? Do you think it will have a knock-on? Yeah, so for, for well, France 2023 next year, the squad sizes are 23 per team. For 20, 20 teams, that's 650-odd players. Um, I think we're coming at a slightly different perspective than everybody else in the panel in that we don't have direct contact with players. We manage the sport, we manage competitions. So I think our role in that is education, uh, raise awareness and to support anybody who wants to do more. Uh, and I think through the guideline that we uh, published last year, we're very much in a place, um, in a, in a place where we're gonna do that. Um, it's gonna take time. I think even from our own competitions, there's um, there's terms of participation that have been signed years ago, so we can't just affect change as quickly as we'd like, but we're slowly getting to the point where we're going to um, make sure that our guidelines are followed within our own competitions, and hopefully that will trickle down to other competitions as, we, as the awareness grows. So in terms of um, the players that are affected and how they react to being colorblind, yeah. um, we know at Swansea that when we screened some of the players, some were willing to speak up and others still haven't because it was an anonymous screening, um, some still haven't even not identified themselves to you so that you can support them. So how, how are you going about that in, in the club to make sure that all of the players are supported even if you don't know who they are? Yeah, we made it clear you know, with yourselves, we made it clear to the players from the beginning that they didn't need to 
identify if, if, you know, if they are colorblind. We don't need to know fundamentally because it's our responsibility to educate the coaches, educate all stakeholders that come into contact with the players, um, and also change the environment. So we've adapted the environment, you know, some, as basic as balls, bibs, cones, and, and, and anything like that. Um, when session planning, coaches now will plan sessions with that in mind to ensure that any risk of clash or, or, or risk for anyone that might be colorblind to impact that session, they're, they're doing it in a preparatory way and they're preventing it being an issue. So quite frankly, as a result of the work that we've done with yourselves and we're continuing to do, all players will be screened potentially now coming in as standard to help encourage, raise awareness around this and education around this. But fundamentally, it makes no difference because if you come into Swansea City Football Club now at any level, uh, you know, men's and boys, women or girls football, it doesn't matter. There will, you know, there will be equipment and sessions designed so that it, the environment is inclusive. That's exactly what I want to hear. Um, but Nick, that must be music to your ears, even though you're not still playing football, um, to know that start, clubs are now starting to understand what you went through and put mitigation in place. Yeah, just changing a few things can make uh, a big difference. If you're training that hard to play football and then the coach puts in two colours that are close together, it literally means that you, haven't, you don't have an opportunity to show your skills and it's, it's quite of a, it's a bit of a blow, to be honest. Um, all that you had to do is maybe change some bibs and have a bit of recognition that there might be an issue, but then that's a problem in itself because it took so long for me to speak and it takes a long time for other people to speak. Without the awareness, the kids, especially the kids, are just gonna not say anything and then one day you might just find that they don't like football anymore or they just turn really bad and you don't know why. A couple of years down the line, you could find out that they had problems seeing different colours and it could have been changed quite simply. So I think it is a really good change. And Adam, what, what your um, questionnaires of coaches and players uh, revealed was quite interesting um, in, in terms of how players felt and what coaches thought they needed to know. Yeah, definitely. I think um, the coaches mentioned that there was a lack of awareness. So they just didn't know what colour blindness was. They didn't know the changes that James mentioned that, that could be made. In terms of the players, they also mentioned that they don't like to actually reveal the fact that they are colour blind, um, potentially because of contract negotiations, even embarrassment as well. So there's a huge kind of mental health kind of implication there. Also a little consideration around, <coughs> as Nick mentioned, in terms of dropout from sport. So if you've got those individuals who are youth, um, we want people to engage in physical activity, so not just looking at the highest level, but also engaging people for the physical benefits of exercise, obviously for the social benefits, and also for the mental health benefits as well. And that's the same with rugby, I assume, Mark, that you want to retain players and... Yeah, absolutely. I think the fact that it's a full contact sport means that we need to make sure that James hit, hit the nail on the head, created an environment where players can perform and be sure of what they're doing. Because if you're not sure who your teammate is or, or who your teammate isn't, you could get hit from when you're not expecting it. And that's obviously a player welfare issue. It's funny, though, one of the things I noticed since we started this project about two years ago, the amount of people within World Rugby who have come up to me saying, oh, I'm colorblind, which I never would have known previous to that, is absolutely astronomical. Not that there's a huge number of them, but it's just the people you would never expect it to just in your day-to-day -day life, uh, that there are a little bit more, there's a little bit more awareness around the office even, and uh, people are... are coming across and sort of discussing their uh, experiences as well. So. And Francisco, you found that too, didn't you? Yeah, uh, regarding the um, involvement of the, the stakeholders, as, as James mentioned, we started to involve involving um, football players, famous people, so that we get the attention of the press in, in our country. And then we start with the different units of the FA, the, the persons, my colleagues that work on um, event management that, that have uh, different roles in the different uh, contacts with the stakeholders and internally with the, the sports unit, the medical office, so because we will expect to make the difference in the end. So, James, you want to say something a minute ago? It, well, it kind of covered all of that, but it was the mental health element as well. I think we underestimate the impact this has 
on players' mental health and potentially then the, that impact and over time um, on your organizations. You know, if, if we're looking at an elite sport environment, you could argue that potentially one of your greatest assets, if that's how you view it, um, you know, isn't able to perform at the highest level, is also having these challenges away from the game with their mental well-being, stuff like that. So it, it all wraps up into one. We underestimate all of these things. Like to some people, it may not seem a significant piece of the puzzle, you know, sort of 1.5 players per squad. But these, these are human beings that are in, you know, who, who, this is their job, this is their chosen career pathway. I think it's a, it's a huge thing to overlook. Um, yeah. And to think, um, yeah, we, I've obviously been, have a lot to say about colour blindness in sport, and I'm trying to be very quiet and keep, you know, <laughs> let everyone else have a chat, uh, talk today. Um, but um, from the very beginning, um, I got a lot of resistance with people saying to me that colour blind people didn't um, actually appear at, in elite sport in any numbers. So now we know that's not actually true. They do appear in significant numbers. Um, and uh, I said at the beginning that we, extrapolating the research. We know there'll be 50 players in the World Cup. In fact, in 2002, there are three players that I actually know of who were colorblind, and they played for three different teams, and they played against each other in the World Cup. So they are there in the World Cup, and they are there at grassroots and all the way through. And what we all need to do is try and make sure that we pull them all as many as possible right the way through the system so everyone gets equal access to the game. Um, I think I've got to wrap up now, so sorry, um, it's a short session, but thanks to all the panellists. Um, for those people who are watching online, we'll catch up with you for some Q&A in a minute. Um, and for those people who are in the room, you've got an opportunity um, to try out the socks over there and the glasses for yourselves um, a bit later on, well, once we've closed the session. And also, the panelists will be around once we've done the online Q&A session to answer any questions that you might have. And tomorrow, um, I think we're going to get a QR code put up on the screen behind. Um, so tomorrow, we're going to do a short session to talk about the resources that we've created. But if you want a sneak peek, if you um, use the QR code behind you, you can see all the resources that we've created as part of this project and have a look at Adam's uh, research results as well. Thanks very much. Enjoy the evening, and uh, thanks again to EFDN for hosting. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Do you want to go ahead, Adam? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you very much for giving up your evening and uh, yeah, coming along to this Q&A session. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer for Moxa Brooks, um, yeah. and I've been conducting some of the research. Um, one of the main projects that we've been looking at um, is looking to show kind of prevalence figures um, within elite sport. Uh, we've predominantly done that within football at the moment, but obviously looking to do that across different sports and not just elite level, but also lower down as well. Um, and what we've actually found in the 118 that we've screened so far um, is that we found seven colorblind players. Okay, so we know that they are there at the highest level um but if you're looking at that as as a percentage that's only six percent whereas the actual kind of national average is um eight percent so it's suggesting that some players maybe aren't making it to the highest level um potentially due to the challenges that they face around color vision deficiency um so off the back of that obviously happy to take questions in terms of how can we support those players um what are some of the challenges that they face um so yeah, I'll hand it back over, but happy to obviously ask, uh, answer any questions directly related to that, um, or obviously anything around kind of supporting individuals, players' experiences as well. We've got a former elite player um, at the end. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> All right, you. Yeah, Andy. yeah, thank you. Yeah, obviously, obviously really interesting research. I think probably the the biggest standout for me was, you, you know, like you just said there, around the fact that players aren't making it to the elite level, which is is the concerning thing. Um, as a colourblind former footballer, also gives me a good excuse as to as to why I didn't make it. Um, but it's I think that for me now is in my role as a, as a coach developer. That's the um, and I, I've already discussed you know that research since it was released this morning with um, with internally with the FA around that and how we can I suppose it's not really a question. It's it's 
it's just you know it's got me thinking about what what's the what is the biggest thing we can do to make sure that those players are getting the best opportunity and obviously Catherine we've worked together in terms of putting you know resources and and, and things in place it's just you know now we've got that that really fantastic and evidence it's what's the, what's the next step isn't it in terms of providing that so I know it's quite a broad question but just you know obviously digesting the the, the research this afternoon having seen it for the first time it's I think that's the big question for me going forward. Yeah, well, we were just talking after the panel session and one of the things we'd like to discuss maybe as the next step is where the resistance is coming from for change at elite level I mean James you raised that particularly um, and um, yeah basically what do we think the resistance is being caused by? Uh, I think from my my view is what I've come across so far is um, a lot of people like to hide behind the fact that, um, well, you know, we didn't have to do anything before and is it really as bad as you're making out and do we really need to do anything? Why should we? Um, and it's breaking through these preconceptions of there's no need for change, which is the hardest thing, I think, from from my side. Um, yeah. James, I think what you wanted to say specifically. Yeah, so I wear two hats, obviously. Um, I'm head of wellbeing and development at Swansea City Football Club. So it's very much the the organisational hat there. And then Beyond the White Line, which is a not-for-profit that I founded sort of in 2018, uh, comes at it through a slightly different lens. So if I may, I'll, I'll go with that hat on. Uh, and sort of cover the badge for a second. My experience to date until working with Swansea was just pure resistance across a lot of these areas. So whether it be colour blindness, whether it be neurodiversity, whether it be mental health, any anything really away from the pitch to do with the human being, it was always met by stakeholder resistance and, and at the most senior level at times. And, and um, I think for me, that's been the biggest breakthrough with Swansea. I mean, it really was you know, a, a blank page where there was no resistance at all. It was welcomed, if anything, and that's enabled us to change the environment, to change the culture, to change the attitude towards these things. And and obviously with the data and with the study and it's, you know, then it's been backed up, uh, going back into my Swansea hat, it's been backed up then when we've done the screening and established that there are players within our first team squad and our academy all the way through. Um, it was really, a, a, a for me, a simple shift it was, um, and I said it in the panel this evening, and I, I think Nick definitely as a former player and yourself could have benefited from this, but it really doesn't matter um, whether you are colorblind, whether you're not. I mean, yes, we need to raise awareness and educate, but it should fundamentally be create the environment, educate coaches so that it doesn't matter. So if you come into that system, it's already, system is already built to accommodate you in the best possible way yeah. and therefore Absolutely. you can thrive you can go through it and have the same experience you can reach your optimum levels and then if you go on to do something else and, and leave football it doesn't matter your experience within it was a positive one so that, for me that should be standard and that resistance just to finish on that sorry the resistance is what i really want to change and use ones is this case study to to drive that systemic change and i think that's what's got to happen for us to make any grounds and I know that you said that it would have made all the difference for you you know your experience uh, coming through sorry I'll turn this so you can see it yeah following <clears throat> following on um, from a player's perspective what you're looking at is an equation of of what your value is and how much you can make an issue out of something which other people might not find an issue so you're there to train you're there to play to your best potential and there's a barrier to your to your playing you actually can't differentiate between the two teams or different colors to tell a coach that at a younger age the coach is looking at what's your value to me um is there another player that we don't have to be concerned about with this issue so no you're not going to tell the coach because it puts you at uh, a negative straight away um within a competitive environment you don't want to isolate anything that's going to make you less than other people. So it's not just the ridicule that you might get. It's also you're going to put yourself at disadvantage. <clears throat> to say that to a to a adult, to say that to a, a grown coach when you're 10, 11, 12, that you've got an issue and can you please change the training session? 
it's a very daunting thing for a child to do. I only spoke up when I was in the professional ranks and I felt like I had the power to to at least tell people that I had an issue and being in the first team it was really tangible that if you can't get the best out of me then you're, you're wasting a player basically and the only difference that I would have said needed to be changed was some consideration literally just don't pick bibs that flash it's, it's quite from 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 a colorblind person's perspective it's quite an easy change but if you're not considering it you just don't think about it and that can be the difference between the levels it can be the difference between the numbers that you're seeing where kids who don't speak up are just going to leave they're not going to play very well so you're going to think that there's some sort of issues which you don't know about mm. um and the adults that get into the elite level they've probably got some sort of coping strategies so that they can hide um so it's not that it's not an issue for them they're just hiding and they're doing it very well um so i think that's from my perspective what i found from a player from a yeah. player's side means have champions on and off the pitch will help push the the dialogue and removing job students yeah that's true the points of the players yeah. can come out of partners help drive this from another perspective no we would love the revenue yeah. yeah it's not visible yeah yeah that you're alienating part of the um the audience so does that mean you're you're forcing people to switch off and they may not otherwise so you're not maximizing uh, the viewership yeah and it's yeah. not just that there's a backlash against the sponsors of organized um yeah i'm not going to name them but you know the sponsors of certain competitions are now starting to get backlash from fans you know moving on from not moving on from the players um but just talking about fans for a while um, sponsors are not going to like getting backlash in social media if they're taking the hit. Um, so maybe they could maybe they could help us push the dial as well. Um, I know that fans are getting more and more keen to directly approach the sponsors if they don't like what happens on the pitch because they can't tell the kits apart or whatever. Facebook come back. I think um, we, we mentioned there in terms of um, people switching off especially watching um you know games on the tv and things like that um the other way that you could look at it is you know there are traditions so for example one of the kit clashes is red red and green so wales versus ireland um that there's guidelines from world rugby in terms of avoiding those kit clashes um but are the sponsors reluctant to change uh, certain kit clashes because that's who they want to see their fans wearing those certain kits do they want to sell more more kits to those individuals yes there's third kits within football as well um which even if those two colors um of the home and away kit aren't necessarily good enough in terms of that kit clash is there a third kit that individuals can bring in um so so we know that there are some guidelines especially for the english football league as well um the guidelines is a great start um Obviously, we need to make sure it's actually implemented and people are taking this on board. That's really the next step. Then one of the things that I always find quite surprising is that clubs can spend millions and millions on a player. Um, and the most fundamental thing is that they can um, perform very quickly in very uh, pressurised circumstances. And yet um, not only do they not check about colour blindness when colour is a fundamental element of the game, um, but they don't then um, want to recognise that this is an issue so they can make the most of the assets. If you look at people purely as financial assets of the assets they've already paid for. Yeah. Uh, that makes no sense to me at all. Um, we do know of one player that moved from a, a club where he played in a in a kit that was not going to be a kit clash issue or have any any issues uh, to a club where potentially as a colourblind person he would have issues and it's well documented that this player his performance was um, significantly worse than the club who bought him was expecting um, and to me it's blatantly obvious why that was um, because the new team that he moved to um, played in a kit that he was going to be struggling to distinguish from the grass and they paid millions and millions for him nobody even thought about it and still they're resisting thinking about it for all the players that they bought that are in that position. Find it bizarre. I think Ryan's got a question. Go on, Ryan. Yeah, just, just, just linked to that, Catherine. I think that 
you know, flipping the research on its head, that that is something that, you know, people have got to take notice of now, isn't it? In terms of the fact that, you know, every every squad that you've screened has got a cold blind player. So, you know, if that's if that's across the board, then like you say, you know, they've got this asset already already in place. So it's a case of, you know, getting the most out of it, isn't it? And hopefully that that element of the research will make people stand up and, and look at what they can do to, to make sure it's the best environment for every player. On, on that, Ryan, though, it was, what's interesting as well is that because it's kind of touched on a previous point about players not wanting to maybe raise it, like Nick referenced and stuff, but also, you know, whether it's a club level or international level, there's a lot of players who, you know, are really struggling and, and they're, they're, they're keeping it sort of, sort of private and they're not willing to disclose it for all the reasons that we cited in the main panel this evening and again now. And I think but we shouldn't we even have that. to rely on them to to sort of yeah. come out and say look this is a challenge for me if we've created this positive environment and this this environment that you know really allows them to thrive and i think you know the responsibility does fundamentally come back to the clubs the associations the, you know, the sponsors all the key stakeholders in the industry and and i don't want to hijack this point with other issues but i mentioned mental health and, and neurodiversity and other things and the list goes on i mean it's not when it, when you really get down to brass tacks it's not a big ask as we said, whether it's balls, bibs and cones, things like that, pl better planning, better education, with the amount of money in the game, it, it this is so insignificant on that landscape that there's really no barrier for this change. Um, yeah. So that's just bizarre. You know. Best thing you said. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, 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 we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, actually. <laughs> quite good. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, I should say that I'm completely blind, not just colour blind, but anyway. Um, no, the point that you were making there is, I'm, and this is not, it might turn into a question, but, you know, I'm not sure what the costs are in terms of like bibs, cones and, and balls. I'm sure there's more to it. But if you look at how much money clubs spend on their academies and how much they invest in that, and if you point out to them that like the difference between that 6% and the 8% means that, that they are they are wasting, literally wasting their own money. It, it, and also, like we're a club, respectfully, you know, we're a club that do have a track record of producing academy players and that go on to be traded on and sold. Or, or, Absolutely. Or, or, but, but also, one if, player. If, if you if you were a player who was colorblind, who was 14, yeah, who wasn't getting anywhere, yeah, and 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 they get to hear about Swansea, that that without them having to identify that's the reason they're going to the Swansea Academy or they're interested, all of a sudden they turn up at Swansea and they're a better player, as if by magic. And, I mean, and if, <laughs> and if they thrive, wrong. if they thrive, it pays for itself almost indefinitely. Yeah. One player, like, I mean, it's you can't even do the numbers, I'm not even going to try, but one player trading out of the academy and being sold even modestly for a modest fee, it pays for itself essentially indefinitely. Yeah. Um, I just wonder whether you know the sort of turning it around and getting the attention of 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 uh, whatever degree of coaching management that actually you, you turn it into a financial issue. I know that I know the world shouldn't be that way, but that's how you might get you might get the attention of somebody who. It is, it is in sport. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about this. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Hi, Catherine and everybody. Um, just picking up on what you said about screening, um, while, while we were talking, discussing that Ireland-Wales rugby match earlier in the year, um, I, I randomly asked a couple of the Ireland players if they'd ever been screened. So this is, this, this is members of the Ireland senior squad, you know, guys okay. who are oh. in their 20s. But now I'm wondering, is the position we'd like to reach really that if you are or are not colorblind is neither here nor there because there, sh there shouldn't be any issues in terms of as you say bibs cones balls kits so you actually you wouldn't need to bother to find out if anybody was colorblind i don't know yeah but i think at the moment we do need to keep screening just to keep proving that this is the very very first evidence that we've got we need to keep proving that those players are there hmm. so we've done it in football we haven't done it in rugby yet we know it's going to be the same pretty much but we haven't done it in rugby yet. So in order to get rugby to buy in, maybe we do need to screen more players in rugby and more in football so that we keep reinforcing the point and eventually people who might be resisting at the moment will change. 
Yeah, and I think yeah. the difference with rugby is there's more players on the field, so more likelihood that there is a colorblind player on the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose conversely to that, I suppose the way rugby is played and the structure of it means players aren't scattered around the field quite so much, so there's maybe a little bit more opportunity for people to hide it. But as I think we've all been saying, it's it's putting players in a position where it doesn't matter if they're colorblind or not. It's the it's the ideal situation. Yeah. Hugh, Hugh, the screening as well right now. Like I agree with you. Ultimately, we'll get to a place where we shouldn't need it at all. But I, the importance of it right now is still it's still really there because it, even for myself, with a club as progressive as as ours and who open you know open their arms to this kind of this research and doing this body of work, I still have. Will, will have had to have built a business case, you know, to go to our, you know, sort of CFO or whomever and say, look, this is the spend, this is what we'll need to commit to uh, now and, and ongoing. Um, so I think, and, and whilst it's modest and I don't think it, it's significant barrier, I, until it becomes so standard, that change, I think it, it, we need the evidence right now to build a case um, for, for everybody to, to, to topple the dominoes, really. Um, so I think, yeah, the screen is quite important for a little bit longer, would you? Would yeah, you? definitely, yeah. Yeah, and Thanks. obviously, very respectfully to, to Swansea and that, that forward-thinking approach, um, it's important to get the bigger organisations involved as well. Yeah. So we've got Francisca here from, from the Portuguese FA, so maybe she just wants to outline. Can I just come in on something that Daniel said um, in the chat? which might be a question for Francisca as well, is he said, is there any chance that UEFA can add this to club licensing regulations? Would that come under you in any way? Yes, from from uh, the Portuguese FA, we are now starting. We want to um, to screen all the all the national teams. I don't know if we will have the chance in the end to, to screen the national A team, but the other ones for sure. Um, regarding UEFA, we don't know. The, they are adding a lot of inclusion topics to the licensing, so probably they could add something like mm-hmm. this as well. Yeah, I think so. It's, I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't. Yeah. It's just that, do they want to? I don't know the answer. We'll have to yeah. ask. <laughs> we will ask. Yeah. <laughs> and and just, uh, just a follow-up question. Um, it's Nick on the end, isn't it? I'm sorry, I don't know Nick's surname. Hello. Yeah, Big North, Nicholas Big North. Hi, hi. How you doing? Great. I mean, I, I'm a colourblind person, but not an elite sportsman, sadly. Um, <laughs> that's my fault. <laughs> but I was colourblind at my uh, amateur level, uh, so I understand what you were saying. Um, is there, in players' minds, do, do you think there'd be a barrier to getting screened? Um, so those players I asked, they hadn't even thought of it, I must admit, but uh, from the player's point of view, would there be a reluctance to be screened, do you, do you think, or should there be should there be no reluctance then? In, in my head, in, in elite sports, probably, mm. only because it could lead you um, at a deficit or it could put you um, under someone else. If there's a lot of education and the players and the coaches and the staff are going to say that it's not a, it's not something that's going to affect you negatively. We just want to see what the numbers are, and we can also make the changes to help you train so that it's more of a level playing field. Because in competitive sports, you are going to get deselection, but you want it to happen where you you've given your best and you don't have anything to say that I I, I was struggling here and I didn't get any help. So. I think as long as you educate the players as well and say that you're not going to get affected negatively, yeah. screening would be a good thing because you'd find people that are keeping quiet or maybe they didn't know or realise. Um, but it's just around you have you want to be careful in elite sports because any little any little smell of not being on the same level as everyone else is something that people run away from uh, straight away. So you'd have to be careful. Um. Yeah, Adam just reminded me as well, just to share with you, um, when we did our screening, so it was all anonymous. The players were given the opportunity pre-screening to disclose if, so once the results were in, if they wished that to be declared to the club, they they could. And if they didn't, it remained anonymous. And also we, when the players went into the screening itself, they weren't going in by name. So like, even the people screening them weren't aware of their identity and again it was their decision whether they wished to disclose that. I absolutely agree with Nick, there was anxiety amongst some of the players around 
you know this and and it was no surprise to me because you know from the beyond the white line stuff i've I've heard many, many, many times players cite the fact they don't want clubs to know if they're struggling, whether it's with um, health or fitness or medical condition or mental health or anything really. So I think the anonymous nature of the screening was a, a really significant piece. Interestingly, though, um, some of the players were open and receptive to it being disclosed. So they said right off the bat, yep, yeah, no problem. Others more reluctant. So yeah. we actually knew of one player. Uh, because he was happy for the disclosure and then there is another player that we know is colorblind but we still to this day don't know their identity is there not also i suppose a, a benefit to the player outside of whatever sport they're playing knowing mm -hmm. that they're colorblind so it's a social yeah Absolutely. topic as well as specific to the sports so. and what a relief by the way yeah. the relief in the players uh, the, the two that I do know of that were happy, um, obviously not discounting the ones that weren't, the relief, because now we can communicate about it and we can talk about it in different contexts and actually they can be an advocate and an ally for others and there's loads of benefits. Um, I just wanted to ask that you, you got the medical teams on board. How hard was that to formulate? I'm not sure who that, that's going to. Probably this way. <laughs> Hi, yeah, Francis. Hello. I think. I didn't understand. The medical teams. How hard was it to you for you to get your medical teams on board with the screening? Oh, it's it it was not um, a big issue. To we we meet them and we explain we we um, we. We show them the studies that we have from Adam that the, the numbers from from the in in general perspective, and then they said that it will be important for 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 us to to screen the players to see what is the prevalence in in our national team and our national teams. So we 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 started we are starting now. Probably in one month we will have some results, and then it will be easier for for the medical staff to implement uh, the big changes. And since we have a, a new player in the national team, they, he will have to to, to be screened for a uh, for for color blind. So for each time you mean? Each yeah, time each time, you each time. And then uh, we think at the same time we could. Push the, the the football clubs to do the same when they're in in their clubs. So I think we will we will start, and now I think it will be a a huge change in the future. I think so. Mm. It's interesting what we found about clubs that we know that screened previously, um, before we started on this project. Um, well, and what we found from players who we screened as part of the project, um, we always ask them, "Have you been screened before? And where have you been screened before?" Um, and we're finding that less than 1% have been screened at their clubs. Um, there's one club that we know used to have a colorblind um, manager in the Premier League, and they screen all the players. And we know of another club in the Premier League where they used to have a colorblind goalkeeper, and they only screen the goalkeepers, <laughs> which <laughs> still makes me laugh. Um, so, uh, and we know of one European club that screens the players, and that's it. Everyone else who had been screened before, and that was just over 12% had been screened by the optometrist and one of them had a colorblind brother. So that's why he was screened. Um, so people are just not even thinking about it. Mm. So to get this buy-in will be fantastic, you know, if national squads are doing it. Yes, Mark. Yeah, um, in, I mean, again, this might be something that's already obvious, but is, it, it strikes me it's almost part of a safeguarding issue for, uh, like pl players in in the in the academy, isn't it? Because the the safeguarding officer has to look after the welfare of the players. Yeah. So Mark, just I, Mark's going to answer that, but yeah, it, that's where it sits for us at the moment. Actually, now, right. For our head of safeguarding player care at teams, they they wrap around this massively. So they were part of the screening process in the in preseason, but also from injury prevention and other uh, sports. Yeah, I suppose just from, from our perspective, we we approach this from a player welfare perspective, looking at it being a full contact sport, and if players aren't certain about who's around them, then there's obviously an increased risk to them. Um, 
based on the, the jerseys being worn, but it, it's very much front and centre from a player welfare perspective. Mm. For yeah. And it's almost like the, 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 the players need to be told that that's, that's part of what the safeguarding are doing, you know, to be promoting it internally almost. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think as well, without, you know, when we talk about high performance elite sport, you know, it is a very small population that, that, we're, that we're talking about. But thinking about people at the lower levels as well, I know we've mentioned the academies a little bit in terms of financial loss, but the huge mental kind of health implications for those individuals that are dropped from academies at young ages. Um, they don't have the cognitive coping strategies in there when they're 9, 10, 13, 14, that maybe people later on in life do. Um, some of the, the research that we've done with, with individuals with CBD, one person spoke about the embarrassment of revealing it um, because people often say, well, what colour is this or what colour is that? Um, at the same time, um, there was also a player that he said he changed teams. So it was a footballer um, and he'd actually changed to a different local team. Now, if you've got a young individual who they're playing with their friends in their local team and they're struggling due to a variety of different factors, it's unlikely that they're going to want to or have that kind of cognitive ability to say, you know what, I'm going to move to a different team where there isn't a kick clash. That individual drops out of sport. The social benefits of being around their friends, the physical benefits of energy expenditure, thinking of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but also the, the kind of cognitive elements as well. We know that sport can be an excellent vehicle for promoting confidence, engaging in that social interaction. Again, if people are dropping out of sport at a young age, that can have huge impact across the lifespan. Mm. That's a point. Good. Sorry, Mark's wife again, if you don't mind. Can I just ask, um, when did testing and screening in schools stop because that's where it, it should come from <laughs> uh well it depends by country so in germany uh, everyone's screened in school at least once so we understand and there are there are player statistics for germany um, on color vision deficiency prevalence in elite sport um in the uk which is i know where you're based um it was completely removed from the school screening in 2009 based on faulty evidence but that's something that we're fighting separately through parliament to and and contact with mps to try and get that back into school screening um so uh, there's now a whole generation of children that have gone all the way through school and academies who are not being screened at school anymore um and most countries are similar to the uk Germany's of uh, a rare outlier in that regard. Yes, Mark. Um, so, so here is a question: Where do where do where do the panel think the best age group to aim to focus to to, to actually shift it? Is it in the like senior academies, is it the first team? Is it like right you know on the pre academies? Where's where's the where's the weeks where's the weeks weak spot to attack just that me sitting here listening now i'm thinking definitely academies based on what you said and what marks um what james has said um i don't know james has got a better in input on that than i have i don't know if i'm going yeah. to get that on to nick because like i have a view but i think it's uh better first hand. i would say as young as possible um because literally you're you're playing when you're seven eight nine mm -hmm. if you get screened at 12 and you've had those years of, of struggle um so as soon as you can just explaining that it's not something that's going to affect them negatively it's just something that you want to see you want to get a good scope of who's in the team um but there's as young as possible because that's when it starts really yeah thank you thank you simone put, put a question in there I can't see it are you typing simone okay Oh, oh, I have to leave. Really sorry, I have to. I have to jump off. I've got to collect from sports practice, but I, <laughs> I'm fully invested in this and would really Brilliant. like to continue working with you to help Thanks. push this. I'll be on the phone shortly. <laughs> 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 After the pickup. Yeah, yeah, not today. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
speak very thank soon. You. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks. Two participants left the call. Jamie's typing something. Again, it was just a, a similar, I'm mindful you need to wrap up the date, so it was just to say uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll catch up with Mark but, uh, and Catherine. I look forward to supporting this uh, further. Thanks, Jamie. That was probably a good time to wrap up everybody, let you go and have your tea or whatever. Um, and thank, thanks all of you for staying on the line and uh, for your interest in this. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks all. You. Take Good care. Bye-bye. Bye. Touch, Catherine. Bye. 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 Bye.